Hi, my name is Christina Osher, and I am co-founder of the Love and Trauma Center. And uh, I'm talking today about relationships and attachment. Um, attachment's the term that people use to describe uh, a very basic way that we relate to other people in our lives. Um, so many, many people have questions about why they have problems in relationships. Um, sometimes those people read self-help books. Sometimes they come to therapy. Um, sometimes they go through relationship after relationship. Um, sometimes uh, they stay in one relationship, but they're really unhappy um, or unsatisfied. Um, and some people just give up on having relationships altogether. So I created this series of short videos um, to educate people on simple ways that, uh, that affect relationships most deeply. So today's talk's on attachment, and I talk about this term because I find it's often at the heart of relationship problems. Um, attachment is one of the most studied aspects of psychology. Yet, I didn't learn about how it impacts adult relationships until I learned about it in graduate school. Um, many, many people know that they have uh, problems in relationships, but I want you to know why, and I want you to know how to fix it. Um, so recognizing simple patterns about attachment is a great place to start. Um, and I want non-therapists to, to have the opportunity to understand how it works and how changing their own attachment style can have a profound effect on their lives. So I want to talk in general about attachment before I get into the specifics. Um, and the, the best way I know how to talk about a definition of attachment is to ask a, a really basic question. You know, how do you feel when you're around other people who are close to you? You know, some people have the experience of um, being around close loved ones and feeling very calm and safe and relaxed. Um, where they can, they, you know, if they're upset, they look forward to spending time with them. You know, they can be comforted. You know, they. It's easy to share and to feel love and, and be loved. Some other people have an experience where they actually feel more anxious or stressed out around people that they're close to. Um, so it's, it's actually very hard to, to feel open and loved and relaxed because uh, they're feeling a little bit anxious or annoyed or perturbed. So the basic definition I want to put out for attachment is that it's the, the basic ability to, to feel loved by and loved for uh, another person uh, in a calm, consistent way. So again, it's, it's a basic ability to feel loved by and loved for another person in a calm, consistent way. So attachment style begins really early in infancy, um, and it, you know there's a window of infancy and early childhood where you're really getting this set of experiences that's going to set a pattern or a template for the rest of your life unless you get new experiences later on that can override that. Um, so again, we've, we've studied this in infants and adults for the last 60 years, so we know its impact really well. Um, it's hard for people to believe sometimes that experiences you had before you can even remember um, can shape you so deeply. So I just want to talk a little bit about how it happens. Um, when kids grow up in an environment where their needs are met consistently and lovingly, um, they learn that people are safe. Um, and that leads to a pattern of anticipating calm and comfort from loved ones. Um, and it really leads to responses in your body of 
of just feeling relaxed. When kids grow up in environments where their needs aren't met, it's much harder for them to expect good things. Um, and as a result, they wind up feeling anxious in relationships or when someone else is around. Um, so it's cause and effect, you know, your early experiences set up how you're going to be responding later on. Um, and even though, you know, you don't remember this consciously, you're remembering it in your nervous system. Um, you know, in your nervous system, anxiety or worry or distrust are really adaptive responses to growing up in situations where you weren't sure what's happening and if needs are getting met. Um, you need to be able to respond quickly and anxiety and being hyper alert is one of those ways that um, kids learn how to you know, try and get more needs met maybe than, than they are. Um, unfortunately, that physical response of anxiety will stay with you when you're near other people that are close to you, um, even through adulthood. So I want to make a point here. Um, I don't want to demonize parents. Um, you know, I do want to make sure that people who are suffering in relationships get the understanding and the tools they need to identify why uh, they're having problems and to fix them. Obviously, uh, you know, abuseful or neglectful parents should be held accountable. I want to make a distinction between them and parents who may not realize or even be in control of events that uh, impact the kid's sense of safety and connectedness. So you can think of attachment as a kind of continuum. So where over here you have people who, who you know, with secure, calm attachment um, in relationships, and over here you have people who grew up um, and had you know, neglectful or abuseful relationships. Um, and, and then in the middle here, there's a large minority of people uh, where they fall somewhere in between. So obviously the worst attachment wounds come from people who had uh, more severe parental problems, such as abuse or neglect. Uh, and these people learned as infants, not only should they not expect empathy or comfort or nurturance, but that they should expect harm or neglect or, or abandonment. Um, lesser degrees of attachment wounds come from interaction patterns that uh, didn't allow for a child's needs to be met consistently. And so usually these are the more common thing that I see in my practice and are along those lines. Um, you know, sometimes a parent was simply overwhelmed when their child was an infant. Um, maybe they had their own anxiety. Or maybe something really horrible happened in the family um, when a child was a baby or toddler. Um, postpartum depression uh, or a family immigrates and is really stressed out when a child's an infant. Um, or maybe uh, a family loses a family member and they're grieving while uh, a new child's uh, entering the picture. Um, if a parent has an addiction or substance abuse, they usually have a hard time uh, being available and responsible. So in all of those instances, you'll find that it's really hard to provide good, consistent support to a baby. Sometimes uh, parents have to have absences from kids at a time before little ones um, actually know what's going on. Um, so, you know, one of the most common of these is having a single parent um, who, out of necessity, has to be away at work. Um, so they can't be there as often as they're needed. So again, I, I really empathize with both parents and children who have situations like that where they, they really don't have as much control over um, these kinds of experiences. 
Um, other examples uh, are like having really early hospitalizations where, you know, say you have a lot of ear infections, you got to go in to the hospital and, um, you know, stay there for days at a time. Um, or have real early surgeries or, or even having parents who have to leave and get medical uh, attention for, you know, sort of longer periods of time. Um, you know, adoptions. You know, all, all of these situations require infants being separated from their caregivers. Um, and when real little kids are separated from their caregivers, they don't understand why um, and they get really scared. So it's easy to discount that a brief uh, absence would have an impact, but we find that they do. Um, so you, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that happened to me, you know, when I was a kid, but it doesn't affect me now. Um, so I just want to suggest that as adults, when we look back at this, we sort of struggle with, well, I shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but we're really looking at that through the lens of adult consciousness. Um, but when it happens to an infant or a toddler, it's actually really scary. So regardless of whether or not you know that one of these situations occurred for you, um, it's really only important if it continues to stand in the way of your relationships now. So I want to talk a little bit about how attachment, you know, relates to common relationship problems. And I want to give some examples of what it looks like. So I'm, I'm going to briefly describe two different kinds of attachment styles and then um, from that middle section of the visual and then give examples of what that looks like in real life. So people who had very traumatic childhoods um, or people who just had a lot of interruptions in getting that care from their caregiver can wind up having something called avoidant attachment. Um, and this one's kind of self-explanatory. These are people who tend to avoid relationships entirely. So they learn their needs wouldn't get met, so they just withdraw to protect themselves. Um, so if people do have relationships, they tend to just be short time, um, or they tend to not be that into the other person. So they, they just don't feel that emotional connection to them. The other type is more ambivalent attachment. So these were kids who experienced some loving connection from those parents, um, but that alternated with periods where their needs weren't met. Um, so people who are ambivalent wind up doing this push-pull kind of relationship. So you know they, they might feel calm and relaxed some of the time, and then all of a sudden they, they feel anxious and worried um, or annoyed or angry. So they might treat you as though they're disinterested or that they even dislike you until you start to pull away. Um, and then those people want you back and they chase after the relationship again. And it can be really confusing. Um, you know, the way I often describe it in my practice is, you know, I'll take two objects to sort of represent the two people and, you know, it, you know, they're trying to maintain this optimal distance that feels good to them. Um, where the person's not too close, but not too far away. Um, but every time person A comes a little closer, person B has to move further away. Um, and every time, you know, vice versa, person B, person A has to move away. So my experience is that uh, attachment is an issue in most cases of commitment problems. Um, you know, if a caregiver wasn't there and available consistently, um, then it's really hard for a person as an adult to feel open and um, at ease and commit. Um, so again, that can happen two different ways. You know, you can either um, withdraw and not have much emotional connection at all, or you might have relationships that go through hot and cold times. So and those ambivalent ones are continually going through breaking up and getting back together cycles or fights um, or even you know, those domestic violence um, cycles, uh, you know, that's just sort of an extreme 
ambivalent reaction. So these aren't things we choose. And you really wind up believing that these people uh, aren't worthy of being your partner or that they really deserve your anger or that they've really done something this time and you need to reject them. Uh, but what I want to suggest is that if you have more than one or have had more than one of these relationships or you're in one of these relationships for a long time, uh, then it means there's probably something going on with your own attachment. Um, sometimes signs can be even subtler. So common ways that someone acts are to make jokes or to be sarcastic. Um, instead of being free around saying I love you or other intimate moments. Um, another really big pattern that I run into is people who have trouble um, making and maintaining eye contact uh, with other people that they're close to. You know, really, this, this can happen in so many ways. It can, you can do it by not committing, by not making eye contact, by working too much, by avoiding sex or intimacy, or uh, by very commonly getting into a fight. Um, by having sort of something that comes in between and takes the attention off. So, you know, people do that with their pets or their kids or, you know, substances, you know, an addiction. Um, anything that can become, you know, part of this triangle that can lessen the intensity of making contact with that one other person. So whatever way you find <laughs> to break that contact off, you know, the cause is the same. You're just trying to keep the other person, you know, from going away entirely or from getting too close. Um, so, you know, there's another really tricky dynamic that happens. Um, if you're with somebody who is, you know, ambivalent and back and forth or just avoidant and commitment phobic, um, you know, you have a tendency to blame the other person um, you know, and say, well, you know, why can't they just commit or, or even wonder, like, well, what is it about me that, you know, keeps that they can't commit to me? Um, but I just want to say that, um, you know, chasers, you know, are with people who have commitment problems for a reason. And it's usually because they don't feel comfortable with somebody who can be closer. So I just want to say that I, I know that this can be really, really painful. Um, you know, uh, these kinds of attachment problems lead to big fights. They lead to they lead to domestic violence. They lead to um, divorce and affairs or feeling unloved. Um, or not having relationships and feeling really, really lonely. So, you know, even if you want to connect, there's just these real physiological body responses and emotional responses that, that feel really, really hard to override um, in order to get close to somebody. And even in more subtle attachment issues, people wind up feeling unloved or having affairs or feeling alienated. So the sad thing about attachment is that it's formed early on and when we're meant to be forming those, you know, senses of how relationships work and and then it remains constant through a person's life if there's no new kinds of experiences. Um, so if, if you had early bad experiences, you know, you tend to have you know, later bad experiences. Um, but the, the good thing about attachment, you know, it's why I'm doing this video and it's why I choose to focus so much of my practice on it, is that in, in kids and in teenagers and in adults, this is something that can be changed and resolved and solved. Um, so that really opens up a door for people um, to have loving, healthy relationships when they didn't ever think that that was possible. 
So, you know, that it's because that anxiety that you're feeling um, when you have anxious attachment is actually, uh, you know, you're actually experiencing heightened heart rates and your muscles clenching. So it's not something in your head that once you realize you can just simply stop. Um, but you can use your head to commit to practicing certain things that will allow your body to relearn a new relaxed response. So by having new experiences, you can help rewire your responses and we can actually change people's attachment from anxious to secure. So, you know, again, I'm a therapist, you know, I, I work in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I and other therapists at the Love and Trauma Center work um, with individuals and couples on attachment along with other issues. Um, so please feel free to contact us if you have questions or you would like more information. Um, I hope that this was helpful uh, and thank you.